Good evening, everyone. We at Nishitasai Associates would like to welcome you all for joining our webinar, Non-Fungible Tokens, The Law in India. Firstly, we would like to thank our partners, FICI, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, for supporting the event. The webinar will be moderated by Gauri Gokhale, who is a leader at the IP, TMT, Entertainment and Data Protection Law Practice at Nishidasai Associates. The speakers include Arushi Jain, leader, IP, TMT, Entertainment and Education Practice, Nishidasai Associates. Jaideep Reddy, leader, FinTech, Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Practice, Nishidasai Associates. Webha Parikh, leader, MNA and PE, TMT, FinTech, Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Practice, Nishidasai Associates. Ipsita Agarwal, Senior Member, Tax Practice at Nishidasai Associates. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to post them on the Q&A box and our speakers will take them up towards the end of the session. I would now hand over to Trisha Bansal from FICI. Thank you, Deepshi. A very warm welcome to everybody on behalf of FICI to this webinar conducted by FICI and Nishad Desai Associates. We are looking forward to a very interesting discussion. I will now hand over to Gauri Gokhale, who will be moderating the session. Thank you, Trisha, and warm evening for, to all of you, though in Mumbai, surprisingly, it's quite cold. Uh, let me start with one you know, quick anecdote. This happened you know, way back in 2013 or so. When Nisha Desai Associates as a firm, uh, we are quite research focused firm and you can see our research center in the background there. So as a part of our research, we started focusing on blockchain, cryptocurrency, uh, all the issues involved in, in relation to that. And I remember, and Vaibhav will also remember, I you know, used to have these debates with Vaibhav as to, is this technology for real? Is this uh, you know, cryptocurrency that we have been talking about? Is it technology for sake of technology or is there something more? What are its applications? And interestingly, you know, so many years, eight years thereafter, we can see such a sort of wide range of applications that we can see of cryptocurrency and NFT being one of them. The reason we had this seminar uh, today is in the recent past, we have seen, though the NFT started back in 2014 15. We have seen sudden surge of NFTs, especially in the media and entertainment industry. And we started getting getting several queries in relation to the same. As always, we always want to share knowledge. So this is a part of our knowledge sharing. We thought that it may be a good idea to share our thoughts, ideas, and what is happening out there uh, insofar as NFTs are concerned with a wider audience. Invite questions, deliberate uh, where we go from here and the like. So with that little bit quick background, let's see in so far as NFTs are concerned, as I said, though it started back in 2014, 15, we have seen sudden surge in the recent past. For example, you know, like very high value NFTs. We saw one of them, Beeple being an example, Beeple's NFT, you know, which sold for $69 million, right? And in the recent past, you would have seen even closer home, lot of Indian companies and celebrities have started launching NFTs and trading in them. Uh, in that context, uh, I would request Vaibhav and Jaideep, if you could just give us a quick background as to, you know, let's go back to basics. What is exactly NFT? Because some in members in the audience may still be grappling with the basic concept. Uh, how do we use it? Uh, what are these applications, especially focusing on media and entertainment, sports and advertising industry? So over to you, Vaibhav and Jaidi. Thanks, Gauri. Welcome, everyone. I'll just share a short presentation and uh, Vaibhav will supplement. Yeah, I just thought it'll be interesting to pick up the most valuable nfts over the last 24 hours as you can see there's nothing more to them than these or maybe there is we'll get into the the nuances uh you can see here the highest value one is uh has been sold for 85 ether or three twenty nine thousand dollars. 
uh, these are part of a series called the Board A Yacht Club, which is uh, gathering steam and pop culture. Uh, you can see here that Eminem, Jimmy Fallon, Stephen Curry, uh, Post Malone, famous uh, figures in, in pop culture are uh, now buying these NFTs and kind of using them as gateway to an exclusive club and that in turn drives the value higher. Uh, also, just in terms of where the market has uh, is gone from where it was, you can see, and, and this is calibrated in billions of dollars with a B, uh, OpenSea monthly volume, which was uh, obviously close to zero some years ago, and now it crossed 4 billion uh, in the previous month. And uh, even daily volume is uh, between 100 and 200 million dollars. Uh, if we're talking on a daily basis, that obviously boggles the mind. Uh, so just in terms of what an NF NFT is, as Gauri said, I'm sure the audience has different levels of familiarity, but just to set a common ground, uh, it can represent ownership of a unique uh, item. It may be a digital item or a physical item. You can think of it as uh, a piece of uh, a code on, on blockchain, uh, maybe a PDF on the blockchain. Now, what is a PDF? I was just discussing with a colleague because when people say, what is an NFT or what is, uh, uh, how should it be treated? You can also think of what is a PDF. It depends what's in the PDF, uh, right? So even in an NFT, it depends whether it's an, it represents an image or it represents music, or it represents something else. Uh, but it's essentially a non-fungible token as uh, the abbreviation goes, where each token is unique, as opposed to say each dollar or each uh, Bitcoin, where one is interchangeable for the other. And we'll go along with uh, some use cases uh, as, we, as we progress. Uh, these are some of the defining features uh, where People often ask why so much money is being paid and some of us may not understand why so much money is being paid. A lot of it is, is just people experimenting with the technology. Uh, we'll, we'll see some of these use cases uh, in the next few minutes as I walk through the uh, uh, use cases. I'm sorry, we'll see some of these attributes in the use cases. So just coming back to this, right? This board Ape Yacht Club NFT. I thought we can just pick it apart a little bit as to what is really going on here. Uh, these are sold on a platform called OpenSea where I'd shown you the volumes earlier. Uh, just to go to the details of this uh, particular item, you can see there's a contract address there. Uh, it's been abbreviated, but it's a long string of numbers, which is basically a blockchain address. You can think of a blockchain address as kind of like an email address. Um, and there is a token ID, the token standard. So ERC721 is a type of technological standard on which NFTs are written. Uh, this is on the Ethereum blockchain. There are many other blockchains which can be used for NFTs. And the metadata is frozen in time. Now let's come to what the metadata actually is. So when you go and click the metadata, you see uh, some of the attributes linked to this NFT, which are stored permanently on the blockchain. You can see that image attribute is linked to a particular IPFS link. IPFS is now one of the decentralized file storage uh, services used. Uh, it's kind of like Dropbox or Google Drive, but a decentralized version of it. So what people are doing for NFTs is they simply create an IPFS link to a particular piece of content and encode it within the NFT so that the blockchain doesn't get the heavy image or heavy sound file and it doesn't become unwieldy on the blockchain. So when you put this unique link uh, onto your browser, you get that particular image. And that of course drives discussion as to um, if somebody owns an NFT with this image encoded, why don't they just download the image and save it and look at it whenever they want? And that's a whole different debate. And I'm sure we can we can grapple with that as we go along this webinar and 
and going forward as well. But uh, NFTs do have some unique attributes which JPEG files don't. Um, for instance, they allow you to receive royalty on future sales of uh, the particular item. Uh, they also allow something called unlockable content where only the owner of the NFT may be able to see that. A good example, and I was just browsing through some use cases, is that um, many times DJs and uh, professional musicians need the lossless or highest quality audio file of a particular song. Uh, if they own the NFT, they, they may have access to it while no one else uh, would have access to it. So you can kind of lock out people who don't have uh, access to that NFT thereby kind of creating higher value in an NFT. Another example is for a graphic designer, you can store the high res file in the NFT so that only the purchaser can use the high res file. Everyone else can just download a low res JPEG and it won't be of much use. Uh, just a quick scan through of how to create an NFT. It's a pretty simple experience on the mainstream platforms like OpenSea. You enter the name, a link, a description, you upload an image or a sound file, um, and you, you, you choose how many you want in terms of the supply field here. You can make one or you can make many. You choose the blockchain um, and you choose some metadata. And it's kind of like listing a product on Amazon or any other marketplace. It's, they've made it quite simple. Uh, just going on to some, some big uh, industry announcements, uh, Twitter announced profile pictures uh, as NFTs, where uh, it profile picture can be linked to a public key address on the blockchain, uh, which would kind of show authenticity to a particular image. Uh, there is a new platform called Royal, where uh, leading artists can actually uh, sell rights to their music. So fans can purchase writes in a song and every time that song gets streamed on the on on streaming platforms fans actually earn royalties from the music uh, you have popular use cases like nba top shot where they sell you uh, pieces of nba history or highlights uh, for for a particular price and then it becomes a collectible item that um, owners seek to to have uh, you also have utility based NFTs, which are a combination of collectible and utility. So there is a game based on Formula One called Formula One Delta Time, which is actually licensed by Formula One. And what happens is you can buy these parts, whether it's brakes or helmet or anything else, you buy them as NFTs and then you use them within the game. So it's not simply about bragging rights. There is then a utility within the game. Similarly, you could have tickets as NFTs, you could have um, any kind of uh, digital instrument as an NFT almost. Uh, and finally, we're, we're seeing now mainstream players like MasterCard um, integrating into the ecosystem. Because one important point is in order to own an NFT, you need to have a crypto wallet. Uh, because NFTs reside in a crypto wallet. They reside along with other uh, crypto tokens that you may have. And uh, there are initiatives now by players like MasterCard where uh, not everyone may want to uh, get a crypto wallet or pay uh, buy a cryptocurrency in order to purchase an NFT. So they're trying to integrate uh, the, the fiat currency payment modes uh, to enable easier purchases of um, NFTs. And of course, these are some of the most uh, famous headline news you may have seen about NFTs, whether it's the Beeple sale or Jack Dorsey's first tweet. Uh, and of course, uh, since we're a law firm, we have to tell you that there may be disputes around NFTs. Uh, there are already the first few disputes where uh, a particular uh, fashion brand has found that uh, its, its trademark uh, bags were being used. In an NFT, there is obviously the artist says it's creative expression, so it's not uh, an appropriation of that trademark. Uh, similarly, Quentin Tarantino had, had used certain excerpts um, of film content uh, where the pr production house felt it's actually their right. 
So uh, this kind of leads us to um, obvious legal questions about how the contractual rights should be ascribed or what rights actually underlie an NFT. Uh, so with that, I'll just hand it over to Vaibhav to add a few points before we move on to others. I hope you guys can hear me. I think uh, JP very well explained uh, uh, NFT, how it works, some of the use cases. I will just add a the first uh, NFT, why it can be used anywhere, uh, you know, in any field. There are a few fields which are what you call uh, low hanging fruits, right? Which is that's where you will find a lot of uses. That's where you will you will see uh, NFTs being used uh, substantially. It already started with art and paintings. You will see it in music. Uh, you will see it in films. Uh, you will see in sporting uh, uh, sporting uh, uh, activities. You will see it in uh, gaming. I think these are the area. These are the industries where NFTs will will really pick up very fast. Uh, then it will actually go into uh, other areas like, for example, in metaverse, what uh, what is going to come in? NFTs will play a very critical, very important role. Uh, also tourism, NFT will play a very important role. Uh, just as an example in metaverse, uh, what we are likely to be already seeing currently is a lot of what they call real estate, virtual real estate as an NFT, which is being used. Uh, so somebody has in a metaverse already created, let's say a Taj Mahal. And uh, the Taj Mahal actually is owned by someone in a metaverse, in a particular metaverse, because there may be more than one metaverse. So each, each of that will have a different uh, real virtual real estate. And then you, you create it. And in that particular metaverse, you own it, and then you can sell it off. Uh, so any major landmarks, you know, whether that will create legal issues or not, uh, is, a, is going to be a question uh, in future which we'll deal with. But that's where uh, you have uh, metaverse uh, uh, where all different NFTs are there. Uh, Taj Mahal, I last read, was being sold for three thousand uh, dollars. You know, you can buy Taj Mahal for three thousand um, dollars. Similarly, you have all different uh, uh, you know major landmark areas where which are being created and kept in a metaverse uh, tourism tourism is the other area where things are really going to go because once the metaverse comes up there'll be a lot of uh, places where people want to visit virtually and they really cannot go and you know often with current situation current pandemic when travel become restricted you will see emergence of virtual tourism and that's where the NFTs will become very important because that's where all this virtual real estate will start uh, 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 getting into details using NFTs to to basically uh, show the authenticity of that particular uh, you know uh, the area which you are visiting. Uh, NFTs can be basically uh, a picture file with uh, with uh, image link. You know, it's like a like a poster, authenticated poster or autograph poster kind of a thing, right? Whether it is of Sachin Tendulkar, whether it is of Shah Khan, whether it is a particular video clip, whether it is a music uh, clip, etc. But from that basic NFTs, it can also become virtual NFTs. Now, as JD had mentioned, right? NFTs are nothing but a similar to they basically a cryptocurrency, but instead of having same multiple fungible cryptocurrencies, number of cryptocurrencies, it is limited cryptocurrency. It can be limited to one, which means makes it the unique crypto, uh, the NFTs, or it can be more than one, but it will be generally limited in nature, right? Uh, it depends on how many you want to create. But you can now make it a functional cryptocurrencies. Where we are really seeing uh, if interesting use cases also, you know, some are already coming up, some will come up in future, uh, but these are all discussion uh, 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 cases. Uh, for example, you go to a concert or you go to a sporting event and your ticket will be an NFT, which means you go and attend a particular VIP seat using that particular NFT. And once that sporting event is over, then the NFT becomes non-functional and then becomes static, which shows that, uh, which shows that you are the original holder of a particular uh, uh, VIP ticket of a World Cup event, right? Uh, 
so this kind of NFTs will come. You know, NFTs can be added up. That right? if you own that particular NFT ticket, right? Not only you can attend a particular uh, 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 seat, a uh, particular event, but also you can take photograph with a particular personality, or you get a picture of particular uh, you know cup holder, and that something goes along with your NFT. So there are various different things can add in an NFT. You can make it as functional as possible, uh, where you can actually uh, uh, use it. And the other thing JD mentioned, and I'll just give you an example is, let's say, uh, uh, let's say tomorrow if Shah Rukh Khan creates a, a movie and wants to create a premiere, right? For select people. Now, typically when you look at premiere, you will have a theater and, you know, people who have, who have, who have been invited can go and, and, uh, is watch the previous movie along with Shah Rukh Khan, right? Uh, on virtual thing, those people who own that NFT can watch that premiere movie and nobody else. And that premiere movie can be for one show, can be one day, can be one week, where only those people who have the NFT can watch before it is publicly release, released. So those kind of things are, are already in works and they are already in some, they already started in some uh, fashion, but this is going to be more and more there where fans of a particular car will get exclusive uh, exclusive option where others will get at a later date or they may not get. And similarly, as they mentioned, a lot of people are looking at, and again, the best part of NFT is that when you, when, when let's say I'm, I have created an NFT, when I sell it to someone, obviously I get money, but when that person sells it further on, at that point of time, also the NFT can be programmed that not only the person who sold it, further sold it, gets the money, but a small portion of royalty also comes to me. So each sale, I keep on getting some point, some money. Uh, similarly, as I did mention earlier, right, that you can also do it on, let's say it's a video clip, you can do it on streaming. For each sale of streaming, you get it. Now, so what you can do, you can create a unique digital marketing uh, uh, creation, right? What you can say, here is my video clip, which I allow people to buy NFT so they can watch, right? For me, but there'll be limited NFT, which means only X number of people watches. Now, that person who has that particular NFT can further sell his right to watch a particular video or a particular event to someone else in which he makes money. And in turn, I get additional royalty from what he makes. So there are various unique ways in which these NFTs can be used. You know, the only imagination is your limit when you are creating functional use of uh, uh, you know, NFT. And I can actually go on and on, but I know I'm very conscious of time. We have already gone beyond what originally we thought we would. So back to Gauri. Thank you, Vaibhav. In fact, uh, you know, our own Copyright Act under Section 53, Capital A has this concept where there is an artwork or uh, you know copyrighted work sold again and again the original owner should actually get something out of that which i don't know whether it really happens but if it is programmed in this blockchain and nft world i guess it is possible now with that let me continue the topic of ip and copyright uh, over to you arushi we heard that you know the underlying aspects uh, of the nfts are really your uh, you know copyrighted most of the time the examples that we saw and especially that we are focusing on media and entertainment industry that is copyrighted works right so in your experience you know since you have been working in this industry for a while how do you see that as to who will have the right uh, among the creators the producers to create these nfts and market them and if you don't have the right but you want to start you know that activity how do you get those rights to create NFTs and put them on the market? So sure, if you sure. can share some thoughts on that. Sure, Gauri. Thanks a ton. And thanks a ton, uh, Jadeep and Webha for setting the context. As we just heard uh, Jadeep and Webha speak, you know, there are endless possibilities as far as an NFT is concerned. In the media and entertainment space, you could have artistic work like drawings and caricatures. You could have posters. You can have musical works such as songs and literary work like scripts and dialogue. So your options are really limitless, so as to say. Now, coming to your question, to be more specific, uh, Gauri, uh, in, a, in a film industry scenario, what we under our law, it is actually the producer who is considered to be the owner of the copyright in, in a film per se. 
So suppose if the producer wants to make an NFT of a poster or maybe a song which is included as part of the film or you know like a scene or a clip, the producer should ideally have the ability to do so because of by virtue of being the copyright owner. However, in the recent past, we have seen this concept of exploitation rights being developed, right? Now, what happens is copyright and exploitation rights are two really different buckets. Uh, many a times, the producer does give the right to exploit certain, uh, you know, exploitation rights to certain third parties. So, for example, digital rights being one. If I've given my rights to exploit the work in digital medium to a third party, the producer may not be in a position to create the NFT because NFT is basically an, you know, a, a, the, the work going digital in that sense. And it may get covered under the definition of digital rights for which the third party has the rights. That's point number one. Point number two, I think there are certain nuances also that one can consider. For example, a lot of times the caricatures or the sketches are of the artist. Questions arise that, you know, do I need to go back and take separate permissions from the artist since I'm using the images, etc. Now, in film contracts, you usually see that when when the artist's performance is included in the film, their, their attributes, whether their voice, their caricature, etc., the rights to use that are also assigned and the artist waives any objection to it. Having said that, if the artist feels that, you know, the NFT is being used for maybe some sort of an endorsement, or they have reserved back some rights, certain, certain times they reserve back merchandising rights or gaming rights, then the use of NFT has to be examined to see whether you need separate permission. Just as an, on a side note, we've seen interesting models developing here also. Jaydeep and Rev have spoke about, you know, royalties being given every time there's a sale. We've also seen artists contracting with the uh, NFT creator for back-to-back -back share in those royalties. So those are, you know, also sort of, uh, developing and the third part is that you know if you don't really own the rights in in the work itself but if you want to create an nft then you have to go back and do the diligence find the original owner of the rights and then make the nft otherwise you can be exposed to infringement related claims i think this also answers some of the questions i saw on the chat back or ch uh, chat box sure so what i understand is you know it's very important and this is something i remember when we started launching the OTT platforms in India, you know, we used to do the due diligence as to where, where exactly is a digital right, you know, being vested, exactly. right? And all those contracts we had to sort of, uh, you know, read appropriately to see, uh, you know, there are no infringements or there are no contractual violations. So similarly, Absolutely. I believe now when you're doing NFTs, we have to look at contractual arrangements, where are the rights, whether there are reserve rights, how the individual's rights, uh, you know, if there is a clip, where only one individual is being used, uh, how will that pan out vis-a-vis -vis that artist contract or the musical rights? And in India, musical rights are, is another you know ball game altogether. So obviously, the the short point what I understand and take away is a due diligence of all the contractual and legal provisions is an absolute must before we get into the actual launch of that particular NFT. Uh, I think um, I think you also you know Jaydeep also mentioned and maybe you can just throw some light on this model where uh, you know obviously uh, just to clarify uh, you know when we uh, when we are talking about NFTs and I'm buyer of the NFT I obviously don't get the right of an underlying work unless there is a spe special provision for that or otherwise but I heard Jaydeep mention some model where you can have an economic right vis-a-vis -vis the work so could you just expand yeah. a little yeah. bit on that and how the contracts would flow? Yeah, I think Gauri, that is a very recent example that even I read about and very so basically this uh, music blockchain based music investment platform called Royal is letting fans invest in the uh, music of this hip hop legend Nas on their platform. So when I basically buy, uh, uh, you know, invest into this particular, uh, you know, music that this uh, legend or this uh, performer is creating, the question that arises is that because I'm putting money into uh, helping him make the music, do I also own a share in the IP? Well, to my mind, and um, that answer is no. What you're really getting is that every time the music is streamed, you are basically getting certain share in the royalties that are earned when the music is getting streamed. So that's coming to the, ex uh, you know, the economic right. I think you summarized it, but just to say it again, 
ownership of ip is different from uh, you know the exploitation or the economic rights in the ip you can have a situation under contracts where you get some upside or you get a percentage or revenue based on how the ip is exploited that doesn't necessarily make you the owner of the intellectual property rights per se so this particular platform is using that construct to let you own because you made an investment but you're not really getting the ip so tomorrow you can't start playing the music or exploiting it to say that i invested in it and hence i'm going to exploit it on my own right i think we also you know saw these when we were debating this example the question also arose that how do you integrate the real world exploitation and the digital world exploitation how will the you know how will the uh, you know royalties that may be earned in the real world get back into the you know in the nft system for me as a user to get the royalties from that i think those things are still developing interestingly you know and we we'll need to see how that uh, you know the real and the digital world converge and you know sort of collaborate in that sense i think the last point of arushi for you is uh, on the on the liability because uh, jaydeep did also mentioned about the fact that you know there somebody had sued someone on trademark or and the uh, you know copyright violation or otherwise so could you just sort of because there are multiple stakeholders here you have a platform or a marketplace as we can call it then you have person who has put the nft uh, the create you know created and put that nft on the marketplace and of course the people who are buying and selling the nfts right so when there yes. is an infringement allegation where do you see the liability and how do you foresee you know from a contractual relationship how it will flow sure gone but before that i'll just take 10 seconds on the trademark point because i did see some questions around it now there has been a case where homes the brand has basically sued an artist because the artist used the mark bokens and then used it for meta bokens and that's the case that jaydeep was referring to now it is a similar scenario to see in a physical world if you're using my trademarks and cashing on my goodwill then i do have the ability to come and you know stop you from infringing my mark because either you are passing off uh, or you're trying to dilute my mark so the principles continue to apply even in this e world so that's point 1 now coming to the specific question that you asked me See the way I see it, most of the NFTs are, uh, you know, platforms are marketplace. That means that they are the facilitators for buyers and sellers to, you know, purchase and sell um, NFTs. Typically, they would fall in the definition of intermediaries, which is a construct under our Information Technology Act. Now, intermediaries do have some safe harbor as far as any infringement claim is concerned. So, suppose a person puts up a particular nft and which is infringing somebody's copyright or there is a trademark included in it can the nft be made part sorry nft platform be made a party to this um, you know dispute well potentially yes but the nft can say that i am an intermediary and therefore i should not be liable but i do have certain responsibilities which is i will take down that content either because it's a violation of my uh, platform policies like we see any other platform like facebook and all where i am not going to allow hosting of unlawful and infringing content or under indian law if you get a court order or a order from any governmental authority you will take down if you don't take down you could be considered to be a publisher of that content and then it becomes a little difficult to defend your liability but um, that's a construct that is available to nft marketplaces and they should to that extent tighten their uh, you know terms and conditions and policies so sure, thanks a lot uh, arushi for you know giving that uh, kind of overview of where we sort of land in so far as copyright and it liabilities are concerned uh jaydeep back to you uh, i know that there are you know the marketplaces that arushi mentioned and you mentioned you know most of them may be you know even situated outside india and in that context we do talk about exchange control laws and you know that come into play so could you just walk us through some of the regulatory issues that you see in terms of for indian companies who want to create nfts on these marketplaces and uh, how generally even for buyers and sellers how it will pan out from a fema perspective fema of course being the foreign exchange management act uh, which is our exchange control law yeah thanks gauri i think fema is the most burning issue for uh, nfts and the wider crypto and blockchain uh, industry 
because these are inherently borderless technologies and they enable the transfer of value across borders. And obviously, FEMA is something which restricts and controls that. So uh, any Indian resident looking to participate in a sale of an NFT, a purchase of an NFT, creation and minting of an NFT, commercializing their uh, content through an NFT needs to keep a close eye on uh, FEMA. And uh, that comes to the point of how would an NFT be categorized under, under FEMA? And really speaking, and this is the way we've been looking at it um, across FEMA, tax, uh, uh, other regulations, contract, etc., is that an NFT is a digital manifestation of something. So what is the underlying thing needs to be looked into? Uh, if the NFT represents a ticket, it will probably be treated as a ticket under FEMA. If it represents uh, software, it will be treated as such. If it represents IP, it will be treated as such. And as we saw, usually these are uh, copyrightable works which are currently being uh, sold and traded as NFTs. So often uh, what would happen is uh, an NFT may be treated as a copyrightable work under FEMA, assuming it represents a copyrightable work. So uh, essentially, uh, therefore, the exchange control laws would apply. Uh, the way FEMA regulates cross-border movements is that one can't simply, um, say, sell something valuable and not receive uh, fiat currency through an authorized dealer bank in return. So. Uh, the authorized dealers under FEMA are the gatekeepers uh, for the entire uh, currency management system. So ideally, a compliant uh, transaction would involve uh, fiat currency uh, movements across borders in exchange for an NFT for a permitted purpose under FEMA, whether it's a current account transaction or a capital account uh, transaction. But across FEMA, across tax, where my colleague Ipsita will come in later, across other regulatory issues, um, across corporate structuring, where Viber will add on, uh, we need to see what is the underlying uh, thing behind an NFT. Uh, an NFT is essentially a digital manifestation of something. But uh, the, red, the red flag or the flag to look out for is any Indian person dealing with an NFT needs to keep an eye out on FEMA tax um, and other regulations, but primarily these two. Sure, thank you. I think, uh, Viber, why don't you sort of, uh, you know, delve further on this specific topic in terms of other regulatory items, but also various structures that you will see in the context of what Jaideep said. Yeah, so thank you, Gauri, and thank you, Jaideep. Uh, also answering one question which Eric has raised, right? One of the uh, important aspect is that when you are actually buying or selling or trading on NFTs, right? You use the tokens, either the Ethereum token, if you are on the Ethereum network or whichever token is used on the particular network to buy or receive when you sell NFT, right? So you need, so on one side you have a, you have, you have a wallet where you transfer the NFT to somebody else, on the other side, you have another wallet where you receive, I mean, in the same wallet or different wallet, but you receive the uh, Ethereum or other tokens, right? Which on which network you are you are on. Uh, now, it doesn't really work. It just because it is completely on blockchain, you need to use a token on that particular blockchain for doing the trading. Uh, you can't really use directly a fiat money in that sense. I mean, you can use, but Ultimately, it will have to get converted into tokens. Now, when you are an Indian resident and you are creating an NFT and selling, let's say to someone who is outside India, and he sends you, let's say, Isa, right? Now, as JD was saying under FEMA, we have a regulation that if you are if you are selling an NFT, is like an exporting of a particular copyrighted, uh, let's say, article. Then under FEMA, you have a your, your law, which says that when you sell within 90 days, you need to receive uh, money for it will be export of goods and commodities, and you will you need to receive money in fiat currency in foreign exchange to authorize banking dealer, right? Banking channels. Now, in that situation, when you receive a particular currency, 
assuming what kind of currency it is and what is the character of currency. Again, that is an open question uh, to interpretation. Most likely it will be considered to be a commodity, then it becomes a cross-border barter. If it becomes a cross-border barter, then you require prior RB approval before you do a cross-border barter. And since you have not taken prior approval, you end up violating PEMA. When you are actually selling an NFT and receiving uh, a, a cryptocurrency for the sale of NFT. So selling an NFT cross-border is perfectly fine, but receiving uh, Ether, Ethereum, or another token could be a violation of uh, PEMA. Um, now, what are different ways you use? Now, if you, for example, selling it to someone in India, then you can receive, that's perfectly fine. So anything within India does not violate FEMA, but anything which is cross-border violates FEMA because you receive some kind of tokens. Uh, so different structures you can create. Uh, there are places where uh, there are people who are, who are set of a marketplace outside India. So you can list yourself outside India. You can appoint someone. They receive, you basically give it to someone, the NFT, license the NFT to someone. They sell NFT on your behalf. They receive token on your behalf. They sell the token and they send you the money on, uh, on fiat currency on a, uh, to authorize banking chat. So, so basically there are multiple ways you do it. One way is to that you actually license out and then that person creates an NFT based on your license, your IP, which you're holding. He further sells it. Uh, he receives the uh, uh, token, the Ethereum. That Ethereum is converted and pays you royalty. So that's one option. The other option is you create an NFT, you sell it, but don't receive any any uh, Ether or tokens on your behalf. He goes and sells it to somebody else receives money and then then pays you because you have 90 days to actually or uh, more actually it can go up to nine months to receive the money and uh, you can you know you can just convert that particular ether and wire the money in your bank account so you can create structures where between indian resident and a non-indian who is then your agent or your uh, uh, person to whom you are selling, uh, who is basically selling this uh, NFT to further uh, people and then get money in token, convert it into fiat and do it is one structure which you can use. Yeah, thanks, Vaibo. I really Vaibo. hope you know that the government uh, doesn't ban the entire crypto space. There have been discussions uh, in the past, but I think now they are getting into the mode of you know creating some hopefully some ecosystem where you know this entire uh, journey can continue but let's uh, let's not uh, crystal uh, ball gaze right now we'll wait and watch uh, but since you mentioned you know there will be funds received and obviously there will be income because you will sell nfts at a price maybe higher than what you have purchased uh, it for right so obviously there is going to be income wherever there is income there is a taxman standing there so, Ipsita, over to you. What is what would be the tax treatment of uh, you know this entire in this entire framework, both from an income tax perspective and GST perspective? Sure, got it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, setting such a nice context of NFT transactions and the different models in which NFTs can work out. Globally, uh, tax authorities have not issued any formal guidance on taxation of uh, NFTs till now except for the Australian tax office. The Australian tax office has also clarified that taxation of NFTs will follow the same principle uh, as taxation of cryptocurrencies. So as such, there's no clear cut guidance on how income from tax uh, from transacting in NFTs will be taxed. Having said this, from a direct tax perspective, uh, taxation of NFTs will differ for each participant. Uh, participating in a transaction depending upon its role and the nature of involvement in that transaction. So let's first talk about creation of NFTs. Like we discussed earlier during the session that NFTs can be created uh, primarily in two ways. First, either through a third party service provider or directly by the artist itself by payment of gas fees to the blockchain administrator. In case where uh, the artist is directly paying gas fees to the blockchain administrator, payment of gas fees itself may be a taxable event. 
this is because uh, generally gas fees is also paid in crypto uh, in cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency being an asset in itself payment of fees may be regarded as a sale of cryptocurrency and hence subject to tax in the hands of the artist in the former case where nfts are created through third party service providers there may be a situation where third party service providers are paying the artists to provide services for enabling the third party uh, service providers to create nfts at the first place in such cases the payment which is received by the artist may qualify either as fees for professional services or as royalty under the income tax act in such a scenario uh, while remitting the payment the third party service provider may also have withholding tax obligations to withhold appropriate taxes as may be applicable on such payments this was on the first leg of creation of nfts coming to the next step on uh, how once nfts are created how what are the tax implications which may apply to a trader so in case a person is trading in nfts the income which arises to that person may either be classified as business income or it may be classified as a capital gain income if the person is in the business of trading uh, in nfts such that it is trading very frequently uh, then the income will be classified as business income the income will be computed by giving effect to the expenses which the person incurs uh, while earning such income in case where the activity uh, where the person who is transacting in nfts is not in the business and it is and it is doing as a one one of activity or as a hobby the income which may arise from such a transaction may be classified as capital gain income in either case uh, the income will be taxable in the hands of the trader another thing which traders should keep in mind uh, while transacting in nfts is that the tax the tax uh, implication may arise both in case of uh, buying uh, nfts as well as in case of selling nfts uh, why will there be a tax implication when one when a person is buying nft because uh, like we discussed earlier in the session typically nfts are bought through cryptocurrencies through these tokens so since since cryptocurrency is also an asset such transactions uh, are likely to be considered as a simultaneous sale of crypto and purchase of nfts therefore even on buying of nfts there may be a tax incidence which the buyer should be wary of coming to the third uh, important participant in a, in, in a in a nft transaction which is the nft marketplace itself uh, for example open sea the 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 platform which jdeep was uh, showcasing earlier there are a couple of income tax issues which may arise for a nft marketplace first being application of equalization levy like we discussed nft marketplace is uh, typically uh, will typically facilitate buying and selling of nfts between traders given the very given the wide definition of e-commerce operator under the finance act it is likely that equalization levy at the rate of 2% may be applicable on the transactions taking place on the nft marketplace platform however this gives this also gives rise to a few complications like uh, given that the consideration in the nft transaction does not flow through the marketplace itself and it flows directly between the buyer and seller because the smart contract is uh, formulated in such a manner the nft marketplace actually has no access over the sale consideration so for the nft marketplace to bear a 2% levy on on an amount which is which it is not receiving it is likely to create some cash flow issues and will likely to create problems for the nft marketplace another important uh, point uh, while uh, determining the applicability of equalization levy on nft marketplaces is the tax base like we discussed earlier uh, typically when nfts are created gas fees is paid to blockchain administrators one issue also may arise as to whether this gas fees will be included in the tax base while computing the equalization levy uh, liability thirdly another important thing which might be a roadblock for nft marketplace is that how will the nft marketplace determine uh, the applicability of el practically how will the nft marketplace 
know whether the person who's trading on its platform is a person resident in India or will it all will it have to track the IP address of each and every uh, trader which is uh, which is uh, transacting on its platform and like we saw earlier given the high, very high volumes of transactions it's not very clear on how practical uh, such a approach may be so this was one one issue on equalization levy which may apply on nft marketplace the second very important issue which nft marketplaces should be uh, aware of is the withholding under section 194o so under section 194o an e-commerce operator is liable to withhold tax at the rate of 1% on uh, on uh, facilitation of sale of uh, goods of a resident seller so in such a case as well since nft market platforms marketplaces also facilitate sale of nfts and sale of NF the nfts may also be owned by resident indians there may be a liability of withholding on the nft marketplace however like in the case of equalization levy a same cash flow issue may also arise in in case of section 194o because the consideration the smart contract is formulated in such a way that the consideration will never flow through the marketplace itself so again there will be a cash flow issue uh, for withholding as well apart from section 194o there are another there are other sections on tax collection and uh, and uh, on purchase of and on withholding on purchase of uh, goods uh, by uh, by sellers applicability determining applicability of these provisions will also be a challenge uh, for nft marketplaces because generally these these provisions apply in case where uh, in situations where the threshold where the turnover of the sellers exceed the specified threshold the way a transaction on a nft marketplace takes place is that there is no direct communication between the buyer and the seller as such so it is not very clear on how the uh, seller or how the buyer will know whether the threshold which is specified in the income tax act is breached by the seller or not so these are a few issues which may uh, be there for nft marketplace as well uh, coming to indirect taxes i think from an indirect tax perspective also like we were discussing earlier uh, on classification of nfts classification of nfts will be uh, will be the key important aspect to determine the applicability of indirect taxes nfts is nothing but a digital token that represents ownership of different assets different items like uh, which may be physical or maybe digital can be created and sold as nfts therefore even from an indirect tax perspective the classification of nfts will depend on the underlying asset it represents broadly the classification may either be of a service or a good in case it is classified as a digital good there are arguments to say and the, depending on how the contract is worded there are arguments to say that uh, sale of a digital good from outside india may not be uh, may not be subject to gst in case it is it is classified as a service since nfts are transferred electronically without any human intervention it is likely to qualify as a oidr service in such a case nft marketplace itself should, should be liable to obtain a gst registration in india and pay the gst uh, on such uh, transactions mm -hmm. in india now this was on the classification once we have classified for gst purposes the the nature of the transaction it will be as next step it will be important to determine what is the taxable base what is the uh, how to value that asset to pay the tax and uh, yeah these two things on tax base like we discussed earlier uh, nf while trading in nfts uh, we mostly trade all the trades happen in exchange of cryptocurrencies in gst also uh, in gst also a trade of nfts in exchange of cryptocurrencies may be seen as a barter transaction and gst may be applicable on both the buyer and the seller so this actually increases the cost of uh, i mean doing business or cost of transacting in nft substantially coming to the valuation of nfts uh, like 
we have seen for cryptocurrencies uh, there are no uh, guidelines on how to value uh, a cryptocurrency till date in india at least similarly due to lack of regulations on how to value the nft it will be very difficult to determine on uh, determine how to pay the tax or how to value nfts for and determine the tax base for that particular transaction coming to gst on the traders like we saw that the volumes of the trade which takes place on the marketplaces is quite high and applicability of testing applicability of gst on such transaction will also be of quite importance and as we know that gst is applicable only if a person is in a business of selling nfts unlike income tax act the word business is very widely defined under the gst provisions so much so that it also includes any trade commerce vocation whether or not the volume frequency continuity or regular, uh, regularity of such transactions is high so in even in cases where a person is uh, doing a one off transaction in nft that person may be considered to be in, considered to be in the business of in selling or trading in nfts and gst may be applicable so these are a few important uh, aspects of indirect taxes that should be kept in mind while uh, transacting in in nfts ipsi sir thanks for that you know overview and i know you had to step in last minute because uh, my yapan who is our colleague who was supposed to be on this panel unfortunately had to step out last minute so thanks a lot and thanks for that excellent overview i'm sure the audience has at least taken some points back in terms of uh, you know how the taxability of these entire transactions will work out though i don't think they have the clear answers as you can see there are gaps available you know still out there but at least they know where the exposure is with yes. that i think i want, would want to go back to jaydeep and vaibhav and just for all the members here uh, because there are you know several questions that we have received on the chat we are extending the time of this webinar by 10 minutes uh those who can stay back please stay back because we will be answering some of the questions that are in the chat box but back to jaydeep and vaibhav i know there are certain other aspects that also we have been uh, we know regulatory aspects that we have been dealing with uh, especially because there are no clear regulations yet yet to govern the industry the industry has been carrying out kycs and things like that so maybe some kind of uh, you know uh, inputs on, from you on that and of course in the recent past we have discussed you know or maybe witnessed several cyber security issues etc also so if you can just sort of throw some light on your experience in terms of how the industry is handling some of the other issues than what we have already discussed sure sure uh, i mean one key uh, thing that cuts across all laws is what would be the characterization and ipsita alluded to that there uh, there is some guidance in the supreme court judgment but the supreme court refrained from actually uh, defining cryptocurrency or slotting it within any particular uh, bucket so in fact the supreme court likened uh, anyone who's done that to a blind man trying to uh, feel an elephant so uh, it it all depends on the context and nature of uh, the transaction but uh, some relevant things to look at are for instance under the consumer protection act and fdi policy i think there were some questions on that as well as odi regulations when trying to characterize the nature of business uh, is it a digital good uh, and uh, something like an ebook as an nft someone can reasonably argue it is a digital good it's a digital product that has utility can be sold and transferred that is a test laid down by the supreme court in the tcs uh, case the famous constitution bench case uh, which kind of lays down the parameters for what is a good uh, so uh, it, it depends on the nature of the nft but if something is a good then you uh, one needs to look at uh, does it meet the fdi norms for e-commerce trading uh, is it a marketplace or is it inventory based e-commerce um, as well as Uh, under the consumer protection act there are the e-commerce rules of 2020 so there are disclosure norms there there are uh, compliance requirements there so a platform uh, needs to kind of look at that if it is uh, dealing with or trading nfts the other one and maybe viber will get into more detail there is on securities laws uh, 
on a platform like Royal, when you're selling tokens representing economic rights, does it amount to a security? In fact, someone in the US filed a case against uh, NBA top shots saying that uh, the tokens are nothing but securities. Uh, finally, uh, there are uh, some uh, allegations and reports that NFTs can sometimes be used as vehicles of money laundering or nefarious purposes given the extremely high values for for things which to the to the naked eye may not have uh, as much value and uh, to that extent it is a best practice to do kyc if you're a platform so that to the extent there are any uh, law enforcement queries uh, then that data can be handed over yeah over to Vibha. thank you jp um uh, i think uh this uh, address a couple of uh, issues like uh, points which uh, Gauri and JD mentioned, right? I think there was also a question on whether something is security or not. Uh, and often uh, it, it is, it actually depends on case by case basis. This is one area where there is not too much guidance on how regulator is going to look at it. In US, you have to meet the HOVI test. Uh, in uh, India, SEBI has been very quiet. So you currently look into the SEBI definition and see whether it is a security or not. Uh, basically, if you if you look at, let's say you are selling a, a particular um, a photograph or, or a music clip or a video clip, right? And you are getting a particular royalty for it. It is unlikely to be a security. Even though if somebody who is buying it is further selling it, it and you have a right to achieve some portion of royalty, it is unlikely to be a, a security. Uh, but moment it becomes complicated, and you know what JD was saying, the first case which has come in actually is a situation where uh, one of the party who is selling is a, has a ownership right in a particular music, and he's selling his ownership right to someone else, right? And the, then the argument is that, look, if he's selling his ownership right, then that ownership right is like shares and he's selling his token, so he's selling his security. So it should be it should be considered to be a security and he needs to meet with all the security related things, right? So it really depends on how things are structured. Again, uh, we don't know how the case is, uh, uh, you know, how, how the court is going to look at it. Currently is at the interim injunction. Uh, they are going to read the, I mean, the court is going to look at the cases later on. Uh, so we'll know how the law develops in the US, but you know, in India and in other parts of the world, we will we will have to see each case by case basis, right? I mean, if 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 the nature of what right or a token which is being sold is going to be in nature of shares or similar, then it is most likely to be security. Uh, otherwise, if it is just pure copyrighted thing, the basic thing what one is doing, it will it is unlikely to be security. That's the that's the information which. I feel right now uh, we have, but anything further will either law will develop or we need to go deeper and look at each case, case you know, separately. Secondly, I would just want to address what Gauri talked about on on uh, hacking aspect. Now, this is this is important because what we have seen is that while some of these are are uh, are uh, you know, all the cryptocurrencies and everything is subject to hack. While these are typically something where if it belongs to me, you know, I can't, nobody can take it away from me because the whole blockchain has record that I put, I own that particular piece of token, right? Uh, which is, which is there, but if I lose my particular key or if I lose my, uh, you know, the image in which it is stored, right? Which typically, thankfully it is in, in more secure places, you know, as JD was mentioning in the right TFS or open sea cloud and that's where they store it and there are always backups there but tomorrow if you don't use those kind of clouds or or, or system and you use it your own system and tomorrow if that is hacked you can actually lose that particular nft uh, or if there is a hacking where somebody's private key is uh, taken away and you know access is taken away and he goes and creates and then also there can be a hacking now, this kind of issues are important uh, because it can create, uh, uh, you know, various uh, problems for the creator. Because you know, if somebody hacks his his uh, access and he creates NFTs and sells it, right? 
uh, and diverts the, the tokens to his wallet. And suddenly then you have an issue uh, where you have actually sold it and what was being sold may have been legal, may have been illegal, and somebody else has got the, got the money. And then, you know, you know the, those kind of problems can also come. It is, thankfully, it is not easy, so it may not uh, come, but those kind of issues can come. And then you need to look at the cybersecurity, cybercrime issue on how do you handle it. Uh, we have cybercrime uh, related uh, already processes set up, cybercrime units and stuff like that. And I do suspect that more and more cyber crime uh, on NFT will happen in future and people will report. But so that is the other area I wanted to touch upon. Over to you, Gauri. Thanks a lot. Uh, I know we are slightly above time. I know that our members have already responded to some of the questions as we were into the session. Uh, I'm requesting Mr. Narang. I know he had a couple of questions. Maybe at this time, if you can directed to the panel members. Uh, in the meantime, others can keep responding in the chat box and then we'll take a few questions. Over to you, Mr. Naran. Uh, thank you very much, Gauri. First, I must say that this has been an excellent session. Each one of your partner speakers have been superb. Now, I have a, I just need to validate a statement. We have created probably India's largest, we're creating, we have actually ready India's largest NFT platform with tokens, with avatars and getting into metaverse. And I have been in the past two weeks advised that this company should not be based in India. It should be based outside India. Uh, now, I just want Jaydeep, what I'm hearing from this conversation is that currently since laws are not very clear. And of course, as Weber would agree that the valuation is in the tokens, not really. I mean, the tokens are eventually will be valued much more than the company. Then it is probably better to have this a company situated in uh, a country like Singapore or perhaps Dubai, if they permit it. Uh, uh, really, and if Indians want to invest, then I, I guess they will have to in, buy the uh, NFTs through the LRS scheme. And as other panelists have uh, said, pay the necessary taxes, etc., whatever the case may be. And most of these NFT uh, agreements we have are with large Indian companies. Uh, who want to tokenize their be music or art or design or anything else. So I just want to validate uh, my thought process uh, with Jaydeep and Weber, maybe just 30 seconds so that you can ask sure. some more questions. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Narang. It's a very pertinent question for any uh, IP owner in India. And um, I think that advice is generally right. Uh, a foreign entity dealing with the NFT and crypto would generally be a safer bet uh, because one, it avoids the policy uncertainty as well as the regulatory uncertainty in India with uh, India only getting the economic benefit. So for instance, the IP could be licensed as Viber mentioned to a foreign entity. That foreign entity can create a crypto wallet, mint the NFT, receive the sale proceeds, and then downstream the royalties minus a small commission uh, into an Indian entity. And that downstreaming can happen through an AD bank for a permitted purpose uh, in fiat currency. So I think broadly what you said is on the right lines. And also uh, from uh, what Jaydeep said, right? Um, what is What is also important is that since we talked about FEMA and from FEMA perspective, if you, most of your buyers are outside India or they're cross border, right? Then having it outside India actually allows you to comply with certain regulations, which I, which Jaydeep and I just talked about. So from that perspective, going outside is easier. Secondly, also because in certain jurisdictions, you can get a license. Right, so it makes it more authenticated and it makes it more uh, uh, legal in that sense that you have an ability to operate in that particular jurisdiction. So it gives you a lot more credibility. So, for example, I understand Dubai. Dubai government has started giving license to you. So you know, so onto the exchanges. So when they when you set up an exchange there and you sell it there, then then that at least gives a lot more credibility that the person who is operating is licensed under that particular law. So those kind of things also available outside India. So, I would also agree that setting up outside India may be easier, uh, better, but there are issues there, right? So, for example, if the buyer is Indian resident, 
then doing a cross border by by Indian buyer to to Singapore or Dubai company and then back to India can have questions you need to look into it. Jaydeep and I talked about a manner in which you can avoid a FEMA issue from the seller perspective, but that doesn't stop the issue from a buyer perspective, the buyer is Indian. So when a buyer is actually buying from Singapore he, or Dubai company, then he, he has the same issue, which is a cross border barter issue, which we talked about, but then that's a, that's a buyer issue which they need to look at it separately. I just thought I will say that and stop here. Yeah, I think that's a 360 answer uh, for you, Mr. Narang. I hope at least that gives you some initial feedback. Uh, excellent. It's really been very ex uh, excellent session. I'm glad you extended it. I wish we had another half an hour, one hour, because <laughs> there's so many questions. But over to you, I will mute myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so there are some additional questions in the chat box. So if I think our team has already answered I'm sorry, but you know, uh, we may be able to take a couple of more uh, by, uh, over to Arushi, Vaibhav, Ipsita, and Jaydeep. Uh, but we we have noted the questions, uh, and we will you know individually write to people uh, uh, where there are similar questions. We can club some of them, but uh, Vaibhav, Jaydeep, uh, and others, if you can just take up some questions, we we may have another four minutes or so. I think uh, one question, there, are, there is a lot of questions on anonymity part, right? So we should take that up uh, uh, separately. Um, and Jaydeep, please feel free to add on, on here, right? Uh, in many cases, the anonymity is, is a myth. Uh, it's, it's not a myth when it comes to uh, crypto or, you know, Bitcoin or, or uh, Ether when, when it can be it's very transparent, but can be traced to a wallet, but who owns the wallet can be a question, right? So that, that becomes an issue. But now more and more, especially in India, there is a KYC which is done and more and more people are doing KYC. So because of that reason, you know, it is not easy to remain anonymous. It's not easy to, to say that, you know, I don't know who the buyer is, so I'm going to go and, you know, I can't go and do anything about it. So there will be, there will, and, and again, for NFTs, for, for example, if I'm going to sell, I can choose not to sell it to someone who is anonymous. So, so that kind of control also exists. So more and more, I think uh, uh, the anonymity will become a thing of a past for NFTs. It may not be for, for uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, but for, uh, for NFTs. And maybe Jaydeep, if you want to add, please add it. Yeah, I mean, now there are uh, not just for NFTs, but crypto and blockchain in general, there's several uh, third party analytics firms uh, like Cypher Trace and many others who uh, carry out analytics of activities on the blockchain, try to analyze what activity may be suspicious, what uh, entity may be associated with a particular wallet, etc. So, uh, and law enforcement agencies do use those tools. Uh, agencies like the FBI have been able to uh, come to the source of uh, several so-called anonymous uh, transactions. So those tools are available at the disposal of uh, law enforcement agencies. But of course, uh, coupled with KYC, uh, they can be even more powerful. Uh, so as a platform, it would always be suggested to do some KYC. Sure, thank you. Uh, I am really sorry, uh, you know, we had over 1000 registrations and we have about, you know, we had, you know, 500 plus participants within a short span of time, uh, we, you know, sort of all of you have attended this. Uh, we appreciate your contribution and also the contribution to our thought process because your questions will make us think more in terms of what other issues that will arise at is as it is a nascent and developing uh, you know sort of uh, uh, sector and overall uh, uh, even from a regulatory legal tax ethical uh, all the issues we have to consider holistically so your questions will uh, help in, uh, help us in that uh, i would request if uh, you want to still send additional questions uh, we will create a separate email id called nft.nda at nishitdesai.com. I repeat, nft.nda at nishitdesai, N-I-S-H-I-T-H-D-E-S-A-I.com. 
and feel free to send your questions. Uh, our admin will already note your questions and we have your email addresses. So we will direct our responses uh, to your email. Uh, you know, give us this week to answer that uh, those questions. And with that, thank you all of you uh, for excellent uh, deliberation this evening. And uh, back to Deepshi and Trisha for closing comments. Before that, Very I also you. personally, I want to personally thank uh, Lena uh, from Fiki with one uh, simple message. She immediately agreed to come on board uh, with Fiki as a partner for this session. So personally, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure Fiki and NDA can contribute a lot in the context of, for the media industry in this, you know, NFT uh, scheme of things. We can also come up with some position paper uh, for the industry, which will help us to take this industry forward. So with that, uh, back to Deepshi and Trisha. Thank and you before, so much, Gauri. Deepshi, Deepshi, before you go, I just wanted to add one thing. We are actually writing a paper. Our paper is near final. Uh, so shortly, we will also release our paper on NFT. We wanted to come out earlier, but we kind of got busy and delayed. There's so much, so much going on. So each delay allow means that I have to now we are now to update the paper, right? So so we will we will come out come out shortly. Uh, in case we are not able to answer your question, you know what you send it to our email because of lack of time or otherwise, and we are sure that our paper will answer those questions, right? So just have patience. Thank you. The paper so will not be an NFT. Yeah. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, audience. I hope this was an in insightful session. As mentioned by Gauri, do feel free to reach out on nft.nda. I have posted the email in the chat box for everyone. Uh, thank you once again to Fiki uh, for supporting us for this event. I now hand over to Trisha. Thanks, Deepshi. Uh, on behalf of Fiki, I would like to thank all the speakers for this very enriching discussion and the audience for taking out the time to attend our webinar. Uh, also, Fiki would love to collaborate with NDA for any future endeavors. Thank you.